Alright, today is Wendy's Day, December 1st, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Where do we start, huh? We had over 1,000 point swing in the Dow Jones, an epic roller coaster ride, one for the books. So here it is, in focus tonight. Remember, don't fight the Fed. And then let's go over some macro data that we got today. And lastly, let's talk about the thing. We start with Jerome Powell, the slayer. And he's slashing throats left and right. Dip buyers getting slashed left and right all over the place. Bloodbath. Because Papa Jerome decided to join the dark side. And now he has the little sidekick with him. You know, the thing. And they're slashing left and right. But before the action took place, believe it or not, the market actually opened higher. Much higher. And then took a dump midday. A.K.A. Gap and Crap. So what were the reasons for the gap? Why was the market bought? Three reasons, in my opinion, of course. Number one, it is hard to kill a bull. And the reason is, the dip buyers have the recency bias on their side. Buying the dip has been working since the marsh bottom of last year. So why not do it again? Of course, one of these days, they're going to catch a falling knife. Perhaps this is the time. But dip buyers continue to buy regardless of the change in Fed policy and the stance of Powell changing from dove to hawk. The majority of the dip buying, of course, is happening from overseas buyers, evident of the pump during the futures market overnight. But we also have dip buyers here, retail mom and pops, and some institutions, of course, buying the dip. The problem is, have you forgotten the golden rule in the stock market don't fight the fed when we were pointing out the extreme valuations in the market and the reckless gambling the speculation etc etc we have been countered by the crowd saying don't fight the fed yes we know what you're saying is right but don't time the market and certainly don't fight the fed the sugar daddy the granddaddy's buying and pumping the market higher so don't fight the fed and now i say to the dip buyers and market pigs what happened to don't fight the fed because papa jerome is no longer on your side anymore Reason number two for the pump in the morning is the beginning of the month, which usually firms and wealth managers get their inflows at the beginning of the month. And we have autopilot programs that allocate those funds right away into the market. And therefore, you saw the IWM pumping higher in the morning. Why? Because the majority of these autopilot programs, the allocating programs, are set to allocate these funds into the IWM specifically. And therefore, we have a pattern throughout the year. Every time the beginning of the month, we see a pump in the IWM due to the inflow funds. And the reason is, the majority of institutions are bullish the reopening, the cyclical side of the market, which is represented by the IWM. Perhaps they did not get the memo that we have the thing and now Jerome Powell is also working with the thing to end the party. But perhaps the most important reason of why the market traded higher in the morning is the optimism that Jerome Powell will do a 180 in his testimony today. So what did Powell do? Of course, he did not walk back his comments. He cannot do that anymore because inflation is a major problem globally. And on top of that, he secured the renomination. So he is untouchable. Either way, Powell even doubled down, saying that he is not at all sure that inflation will fade next year. This is yet another hawkish comment, which means that Powell will not only accelerate the tapering program, but he will perhaps dip into raising interest rates abruptly, as we have discussed numerous times in this program. And of course, the geniuses over at TV and the Wall Streeters and the likes are attributing today's slide, the massive dump that we saw midday, started midday, but accelerated by the end of the day, on the rise of the thing because we got the first case of the thing here in the United States of America. And I say bullshit, of course, because the slump started the moment Powell finished his testimony and he did not walk back his comments. And then we got the news about the thing arriving here in the US and that accelerated the sell-off. But it certainly was not the precursor of the sell-off. Folks, we've been dealing with the thing. It has been with us since last year with different variants, hundreds of thousands of fatalities, a lot of disruption and destruction in the economy, including small businesses. And yet the stock market continued to go higher and higher and higher. So to blame it on the thing is absolutely absurd. 
you have no clue what you're talking about. Yet yeah, this is the media's narrative right now. The market went down due to the first case of the thing. Absolutely false. The market went down because they realized that Powell will not be accommodative anymore. Powell is not an ally anymore to the market. Powell is a foe, and he has to be a foe. And until and unless the chairman of the Fed, Jerome Powell, reverses his stance and says, you know what, we might taper, but we're not going to accelerate the tapering, and we are certainly not going to raise interest rates abruptly. Then the market bottoms and moves higher, regardless of the thing. And of course, all the propagandists, including the OECD, which stands for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, are urging Powell not to tighten and not to panic in face of this inflation. And of course, the geniuses at the OECD provided this uh, forecast to Powell that inflation will ease and we're getting closer to the peak. And the forecast is wrong because they're forecasting the top of the inflation in the United States at 5.5% almost. We are already over 6% now, so the forecast is wrong to begin with. And mind you, these geniuses have also been forecasting the economic growth, and they've been revising it over and over and over again, trimming it down as they go along the way. In other words, they don't have the slightest clue what they're talking about. Yet they're urging Powell not to tighten. Will Powell listen? That remains to be seen. For now, we know he's not going to listen. His chairmanship is on stone now. He's untouchable. You cannot fire the head of the Federal Reserve. It will be a political mistake by the Biden administration, and he's certainly not going to do it after renominating Powell. He already discussed with him that inflation is a problem, and you got to do what you got to do right now, even if it crashes the stock market and the real estate market, in hope, of course that all of that will recover by the midterms of 2022. And of course, Powell will not do such a thing. He's not going to tighten or take a hawkish stance without the blessings and the permission from the oligarchs. Because the oligarchs already dumped over $69 billion worth of stock. They're done here. They won. They're cashing in. They want the crash to happen. Crashes are the best thing that ever happened to the rich because they get to scoop up assets at a cheaper price. The crash was good for them in 29. It was good for them in the dot-com bubble. It was good for them in 2007, 2009. And it will be good to them again when the market crashes, be it this year or next year. The oligarchs, of course, dumped at the top of the market in court nation with Powell, I'm sure. For example, Elon Musk dumped over $10 billion so far in Tesla stock. Bezos, almost $10 billion. The Walton family, over $6 billion. Zucchiniberg, over $4 billion. And the two guys from Google, who nobody cares about anymore, also dumping like crazy. And we will do a video over the weekend for Insider Trades, and you will be stunned by the amount of money they're dumping. They're dumping like there is no tomorrow. And while the rich dumps, the poor catches. The retail geniuses are buying stocks. They're buying the dip. They did not get the memo yet. So you can be a rational, tactical market participant by counting your blessings, booking some profits, at least, if not dumping positions all together, specifically the high runners, and perhaps wait for a better opportunity to buy. There is always an opportunity to buy in the market. Or you can be uh, like Mama Kathy Wood, aka Tesla Witch Kathy Wood, who buys the dip at everything and anything that goes down, including Twitter, by the way. And she continues to... Catch a falling knife, after a falling knife, after a falling knife. And I cannot wait for her memoir this Christmas, How to Catch a Falling Knife and Still Manage to Sound Smart by Kathy Wood. And of course, Kathy's just a glorified gambler. She was lucky to be at the right time at the right place. I don't know why they continue to interview her on TV as some market expert, because at the end of the day, we have seen this movie before. This is the next bomb, by the way, the blow up of Archegos... 2.0. Some of you might remember the dot-com funds, which outperformed the market like crazy. The new Warren Buffetts of the world. Remember that? Like Munder Munder, for example. And after the crash, they called it murder, murder. The managers, they get away with the money. They already collected their fees. They have billions of dollars, but the investors end up holding the bag. And some of you old-timers might remember the Manhattan Fund by Gerald Tsai, perhaps the founding father of the so-called momentum investing. 
who died a billionaire, but his investors, not so much. Of course, we could care less about Mama Kathy and these uh, fund managers. Who cares? If they blow up, they blow up. We care about the economy. Will the economy blow up or not after the Fed starts to tighten? That is the million dollars question. And the problem with this economy, the design of this economy, the rotten, trickled down economy, which never worked, by the way, because we have an economy by design, engineered, to be reliant on the performance of the stock market. The problem is with this uh, model is when the stock market does good, the rich do great. They are the majority of holders in the stock market. And some of those gains trickle down to us because we have certain retirement accounts in the stock market. Some of us participate here and there in the stock market. But mind you, our share of the stock market is only about 11%. And some of the gains trickle down in uh, the form of jobs. But here's the problem. When things take a turn to the southern destination in the stock market, the rich, they don't feel the pain. They're already dumping at the top. But all of us collectively feel the pain because we have an economy that is highly dependent on the performance of the stock market. When the stock market crashes, you're going to see job losses. You're going to see companies reducing spending and all of us will suffer. So again, is this really capitalism or is this really a sound economic model? Of course not. And for now, this is the segue, by the way, for now, from the macroeconomics data that we have, the economy is still holding, but we have a lot of signs to worry about. A, signs for stagflation. B, signs that this economy is highly dependent on the so-called accommodation by the Fed and the stimulus by the federal government. And as that starts to fade away, will the economy hold? This is the challenge for Biden and Powell. My hunch is the economy will not hold because it is highly dependent on the performance of the stock market. This has been by design, by the way. It shouldn't be this way. We should have a bottom-up approach, the classical model of American capitalism, which needs to be reset, by the way, from time to time. And the last reset we had to this so-called capitalist model was back in the Rockefeller era, almost a 100 years ago, when we had the antitrust laws. But the classical American capitalist model, the likes that we've seen in the 1940s, and 50s, the thrive of small businesses, mom and pops, home affordability. By the time you're 30, you can afford a home, you can afford to get married, to have kids, to have a car that you own in the driveway. All of this, the American dream, is unattainable right now. So what we have is not capitalism. What we have is gangsterism, and it needs to end and it needs to be uprooted and reformed right away. And that leads us to the macro data that we got in the morning today, including the Fed's so-called beige book and in it they say we find widespread price hikes in november wow <laughs> wow the consumer has been complaining about higher prices since before the summer and now the fed says wow we had no clue that prices are rising like crazy i wonder how that happened but yet the fed has to weasel their way around in the descriptions of what's going on with prices that consumers are facing every day for example they say prices rose at a moderate to robust pace with price hikes widespread across sectors of the economy. Now, this word, robust, is in the manual of how to be a sociopath 101. These are one of the words that you use to mask the reality, of course. For example, if you ask the dip buyers today, did you lose a lot of money? And they'll say, well, my losses were not that big. They were just robust, right? Honey, I still love you. My love for you is still robust. But I still want to carry on with that affair. Papa John says their sauce is robust. Try our new robust tomato sauce. And of course, you eat it and get a food poisoning right away. And then we can describe the action in the bathroom as robust. Anyways, the Fed adds input costs increases were quote unquote wide ranging due to strong demand for raw materials, logistical challenges, and labor market tightness. I wonder why. What was the reason for all of that? Tight labor markets meant wages were also rising at a here it is again, quote-unquote, robust pace across most of the Fed's 12 districts. One silver lining was that some inputs were becoming more widely available, easing some of the pressure. 
um, lumber. Strong demand generally allowed firms to raise prices with little pushback, though contractual obligations held back some firms from increasing prices. And perhaps we should look at the manufacturing PMI that we got in the morning because it went down. So we have the Chicago PMI down. These are the measures for economic activities, by the way. The Chicago PMI says down. The manufacturing PMI is down. What about prices, though? Here is the commentary from Chris Williamson, the chief economist producing this report. And he says broad swathes of U.S. manufacturing remain hamstrung by supply chain bottlenecks and difficulties difficulties filling staff vacancies. What's up with the fancy wording here, Mr. Williamson? Hamstrung? How about just, uh, challenged? Remain challenged or robust? Anyways, although November brought some signs of supply chain problems easing slightly to the lowest recorded for six months, widespread shortages of inputs meant production growth was again severely constrained to the extent that the survey is so far consistent with manufacturing acting as a drag on the economy during the fourth quarter. Listen to this. While demand remains firm, November brought signs of of new order growth cooling to the lowest level so far this year, linked to shortages limiting scope to boost sales and signs of pushback from customers as prices continued to rise sharply during the month. It was the important part, while average selling price inflation eased as firms sought to win customers, the rate of import cost inflation hit a new high, hinting at a squeeze on margins. So we have a rebellion here from the consumer, saying, you know what, we're not going to pay the higher prices. These are wholesalers, of course, not you and I. So the manufacturers have to eat it up. They have to eat the loss. And therefore, their margins will be squeezed. Is this good for these manufacturers? Of course not. And this battle between manufacturers and customers is really important. The customers are refusing higher prices. The manufacturers, for now, are saying, okay, we'll eat the loss. Our margins are going to get squeezed. But in the long run, what is that going to lead to? The answer is stagflation. The manufacturers have no incentive to continue to see their margins getting squeezed. And therefore, they're going to hike prices either way and accept lower volume of sales at a higher price. And therefore, the economic activities will slow down, but prices will linger higher. And thus the phenomenon of stagflation, which also becoming robust in the economy. And then we got the ADP, private payrolls, which is the appetizer for the big jobs report we're about to get on Friday. So how did the private sector of the economy do? Here it is. In November, the private sector of the economy created about 534,000 jobs with the small businesses creating 115,000 jobs, mid-sized businesses 142,000 jobs, and lastly large businesses with 277,000 jobs created in November. All good numbers. What about the goods producing sector of the economy? We added 110,000 jobs, 7,000 in natural resources and mining, 50,000 in manufacturing, 52,000 in construction. When it comes to the service providing sector of the economy, we have created 424,000 jobs last month, with 78,000 for trade, transportation, aka Amazon jobs. And then we have 55,000 in education and healthcare, 10,000 in information, most importantly, 136,000 for leisure and hospitality. The assumption is we're going to start to slow down that pace of job creation in that particular sector of the economy due to the rise of the thing. We have also created 13,000 jobs in financial activities and 22,000 jobs in other services, whatever that is, and lastly, 110,000 jobs in professional and business. So all in all, the pace of jobs creation in the private sector of the economy was robust. The problem is, it is actually ticking down slightly from the prior month of October. The million dollars question is, what will happen to the pace of jobs recovery, because this is what it really is, and jobs creation when the Fed removes the accommodation and perhaps tighten the monetary policy. Because you got to remember this, if the rise of the thing right now is serious, prompting not necessarily lockdowns, but perhaps certain restrictions, but most importantly, changes in the consumer behavior, meaning not spending in services and restaurants, in retail businesses anymore, staying at home because they're afraid of the thing, then we might 
Keyword might see job losses or at least a slowdown in the pace of recovery and creation in sectors the likes of retail, leisure, and hospitality. And if that happens and we start to see a slowdown in the pace of jobs, creation, and recovery, the arrows will come out pointing at Jerome Powell. Why are you tightening right now when you have the thing denting down the pace of jobs, creation, and economic activities, meaning inflation is already cooling off due to the rise of the thing. Why are you adding gasoline to the fire here by tightening so aggressively right now, Mr. Powell, right? Powell would answer or counter by saying, well, we know that the thing is stagflationary in nature in the long run. If we sit down and allow it to happen, then our experience from the previous variant, also known as the D, right, which slowed down the pace of economic activities and dented the pace of jobs recovery and creation. But at the end of the day, the rise of the D gave us higher inflation because it slowed down ports, factories, manufacturers, etc., etc. This is the debate in the economy that we're going to have from this point on. You're going to see data perhaps pointing to a slowing down of inflation and the pace of economic activities. But you're also going to see the Fed countering by saying, well, what about the long run? What happens when the thing dents supply even more? And we continue to stimulate and demand becomes pent up demand. And here we go again, prices continue to rise higher and higher and higher in the long run. Keep that in mind. But here's the important take for now, the message from the bond market, because there is another rule in the market that says always trust the bond market. Whatever the bond market says, trust it. What are we seeing right now in the yield curve? The yield curve is flattening as the Fed hints at a more aggressive tapering. What am I talking about here? Here is the yield curve, as you can see. There is the short end of the yield curve, the monthly all the way to the two-year. This is the part that the Fed controls. And then you have from the two-year all the way to the seven-year, that's the belly of the curve. And lastly, perhaps most importantly, the long end of the yield curve, the 10 all the way to the 30. In a healthy yield curve, you have a steep yield curve, meaning the 30 pays more than the 20, the 20 pays more than the 10, the 5 pays more than the 2, so on and so forth. Makes sense, right? If you're going to hold a bond for 30 years, it should pay more than the 20. What do we have right now? We have inversion in the long end of the yield curve, meaning the 30 is paying less than the 20. And every time, always, always, when we have yield curve inversion, it is a predictor accurately of upcoming recession. Now keep in mind, the entirety of the yield curve did not invert yet. But this is an alarming move from the yield curve, that the 30 now pays less than the 20. Now let's say the Fed starts to tighten by tapering more and perhaps raising interest rates abruptly. They have control over the short end of the yield curve, meaning if they start to raise interest rates, the two-year yield will start to skyrocket. There is no guarantee here that the 10-year or the 30-year will do the same. And thus, we're going to have a steep yield curve, a healthy, steep yield curve. What if the Fed raises interest rates and we have the short end surging higher while the long end, the 10-year all the way to the 30, plummeting down? Then we're going to have an inverse yield curve, an inverted yield curve which is always an indicator of an upcoming recession. And the message from the bond market is, perhaps if the Fed tightens right now by raising interest rates, this will drive the economy into a recession. Can we do anything about it? Perhaps we don't have any other choice. Recession will happen either way. Perhaps it is the remedy to sober up this economy and this market from the coked up era. So keep that in mind. Lastly, let's talk about the thing because everybody's talking about it and falsely attributing the slump of the stock market today in the first case of the thing here in the US. Here are the facts. Hospitalizations are rising dramatically in South Africa, indicating that the thing is highly contagious. And of course, it is found in 74% of the 249 The Thing samples from the gene sequences, of course, in Africa in November. And this is yet another indicator that this thing is highly contagious. And of course, it didn't take long before we found out that we have the first case here in the United States. This was expected, of course. It is not a marked surprise. Yet the anchor from seeing BC looks like that either he's crying or he just shit his pants. And here are the details. The first case of the thing was reported in California, a traveler returning from South Africa. And this traveler was uh, fully shot, but not boosted, indicating that perhaps we're going to need new shots. So we have investors betting now. Is it going to be Moderna or Pfizer? And I say I'm going with Pfizer. 
on this one because Moderna, we have more bad news here. It could, could be sued if you get a side effect from the shot. If your heart explodes, for example, you can sue Moderna and Moderna can send you a spare part, you know, a spare heart that you can use. But in the land of Pfizer, things are going great. Pfizer made over $36 billion in deals and they're calling the Pfizer CEO the dean of the jabs. So when it comes to the battle between Moderna and Pfizer, my money is on Pfizer because they also tend to donate more to your beloved politicians and therefore they're going to have the favoritism. Speaking of your beloved politicians, here it is. We have another thing we have to worry about, by the way, which is the debt ceiling. Your beloved politicians are coming back from holidays. And of course, they spend their holidays uh, in the mansions of their pimps, right? Biden spent the holidays in the mansion of Rubenstein. And all of your politicians are spending their holidays in the mansions of their pimps. That's how it works. But now that they're back, they have a lot to deal with. From funding the government to avoid a shutdown, to raising the debt limit to avoid the default, voting on defense spending, so watch out for Lockheed, Northrop, and the rest. And they're also going to vote on the Triple B bill, the Build Back Better plan. And of course, we have trouble right away, because the so-called Freedom Caucus is now urging McConnell to get out of his shell and shut down the government over jab mandates. And of course, McConnell responded by saying, uh, not going to do that, at least for now. And mind you, this guy, somebody, of course, we just got this revelation, somebody donated $33 million to his so-called non-profit group, which I'm pretty sure it is just for non-profit. He doesn't get paid at all. And so far, he raised $172 million in 2022 alone for his non-profit. And then we have uh, delusional senile leader Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, and she said we must fund the government to avoid the shutdown because of the pandemic, right? We have to pay our bills. And by paying our bills, she means raising the debt ceiling, which is not paying your debt. You're just pushing your debt limit higher. You can borrow more now. So it is not really paying our debt. It is let's just borrow more with no consequences. What a freak show. But this is what we're watching right now because it will impact the market, no doubt about it. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we're moving on to the market's coverage today, starting with the market performance. And here we go. The Dow Industrial Average dropping like a rock, down 461.68 points, or a decline of 1.34%. The Nasdaq down 283.64 points, or a decline of 1.83%. The S&P 500 also down 53.96 points, or a decline of 1.18%. What about the sector's performance today? Awful red across the board, with exception of utilities, which managed to close pretty much at the flat line. The laggards are led by cyclicals, communication services, and technology. What about the advanced decline ratios? The NYSE, 36% advancing versus 62% declining. The NASDAQ, 29% advancing versus 68% declining. And here it is again, the announcement. Every time we have these exaggerated ratios to the downside, that elicit a reaction from the algos, at least during the overnight market, for a rebound. So the market rebounds, but so far the rebounds are not being followed up. We're seeing sell the rip. Moving on to futures, what's going on here? Crude oil prices were actually trading higher in the morning. But when did the decline happen? If you've been watching, the moment Powell just wrapped up his testimony and he did not walk back the comments, we started to see the losses accelerating in the WTI and Brent. And then came the double whammy, the first case of the thing here in the US. Both Powell and his ally, the little Pokemon that he got, are heading the demand dramatically in the oil market. And therefore, up until yesterday, I was still bullish on oil. The reason why I became neutral on oil, because the dent from the thing on the demand for oil is slim. We know that already. But when Powell wants to add a double whammy and completely crush the demand by tightening the monetary policy aggressively, then he cannot be so bullish in oil anymore. Because yes, OPEC has the power to reduce the supply, and if they do so, they say, you know what? The uncertainty is too high. We're going to cut supply next year. Oil prices will recover. The problem is, with the lack of speculation, with the lack of the easy money policy, 
You're not going to see the aggressive bidding higher in oil prices. Not going to happen anymore. Although the retail crowd did not get the message, at least not for now. Because suddenly, after the crash in oil prices, now retail is interested in the speculation in that particular market. A little too late, in my opinion. Oil markets' wild moves catch the attention of retail traders. And as you can see, they're bidding contracts higher, at least for now. But the big guys, perhaps going to pull back. Although, we still have some bullish catalysts here for crude oil prices to move a little higher, at least recover, a rebound. And the reason is, the crash in oil prices is so exaggerated, so extreme, it is divorced from the fundamentals. Oil prices have tanked so hard, traders are assuming planes will not fly for three months, says Goldman Sachs. This is a false assumption, of course. It is too extreme. We're still gonna fly, at least for now. This is from what we know for now. They could be right, but it is an extreme scenario here. Therefore, oil prices will rebound. What would be the catalyst, at least for now, it could be OPEC indicating supply cuts next year. But mind you, if Powell continues in this path, I don't see oil moving back to 100 or 150. All of these price targets that we had before when inflation was running rampant. Now we have the rise of the thing hitting inflation, at least in the short term. But we have the big dog, the market maker, Jerome Powell. He wants to hit demand right now. I cannot go against the Fed. Remember, don't fight the Fed. Tapering is not the immediate concern for oil prices, but raising interest rates, that will do it. So Powell needs to come out and say, you know what? Yes, we might taper aggressively, but raising interest rates, not going to happen, at least not for now. Then oil prices will have the catalyst again to move higher. At the end of the day, oil prices finished down. The WTI was down about 1%. Crude oil Brent was down about half a percentage point. We also saw a slump in natural gas prices, which were down about 6.7%. If natural gas prices continue to slump, this will be good for us consumers in this winter season, and it will certainly dent inflation down. So you can see inflation readings in December diving down if we continue to maintain hitting commodities prices down. What about softs? We have muted action for cocoa, coffee, and sugar. Yet it was a down day for both cotton and OJ futures. Lumber futures, on the other hand, continue to rise higher. And the reason is we have the 10-year yield diving down. Therefore, mortgage rates also diving down. This is good for home builders, the housing market, and therefore lumber prices. Stick around for the heat map analysis. I have a trade idea here. Uh, what about metals? Gold rising higher slightly, but we have a massive down day for silver. The divorce between gold and silver is interesting. Then we have platinum on the flat line, yet we have losses for copper. And lastly, palladium surging higher by about 2% today. What about meats? Modest gains for both live and feeder cattle futures. Meanwhile, lean hogs on the flat line. Moving on to grains, we have a rebound for soybean meal, soybeans, corn, wheat, canola, all rebounding higher. Yet we have declines for oats, the poster boy for inflation in grains, and then muted activities for both rough rice and soybean oil futures. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? The hottest table by far remains Apple with over 3 million contracts exchanging hands today. About 67% of those were calls. And by the way, remember yesterday when the geniuses over at CNBC and the media were saying, oh, Apple bucked the trend because Apple is safety. Then how come Apple did not buck the trend today? Why did it go down? I'll tell you why. Because the pump in Apple yesterday was artificially done via manipulation manipulating the options market. And today, they achieved their goal. They got to 165, almost to 170. They scored big. The implied volatility started to rise over 30%. They booked their profits and poof. Apple is no longer safety, right? But here it is, number two, we have Bank of America with over 1 million contracts traded today. About 94% of those were calls. And the reason is we have dividends tomorrow and therefore the holders sell calls with expectations that the stock will go down tomorrow. Likewise, we have a number three, Petrobras also issuing dividends tomorrow and therefore they're selling calls with expectations that the stock will go down. What about the unusual activities that took place in the casino today? Starting with AMC. We saw a lot of call options buying in AMC here. 
We have the critical support at 32, which was broken today, so it's not a bullish development here for AMC, but it is extremely oversold. So we have traders expecting a rebound here within two days by the end of the week. And here it is, one of the trades buying the 34 calls. So the expectations here that AMC will recover the support it lost today. And this is for the expiration date, December 3rd, which means this upcoming Friday with the expectations that AMC will pop higher by more than 19% by then they paid about 36 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about half a million dollars what about the trade for the ticker iwm they're beating up the russell 2000 like crazy and now they're buying more puts the 198 for the expiration date january 21st with the expectations that the iwm will dive down by an additional seven percent or more by then and they paid about six bucks a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 8.4 million dollars what about the trade for the ticker RCL this is Royal Caribbean not the best name in cruises but they're buying calls here these 75 calls for the expiration date February 18th with expectations that the name could pop higher by more than 16 and a half percent by then this is of course perhaps seeing the light at the end of the tunnel that the thing is not serious and therefore the dip in cruises is worthy of buying too early to say but this is what they're betting on at least for now they paid about three bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about four million dollars at the bottom of the table what about mrna moderna they're buying calls here with two days till expiration perhaps pending news who knows but they're buying the 330 calls for the expiration date this upcoming friday december 3rd with the expectations that moderna will pop higher by more than six percent by then they paid about four bucks and 30 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about three million dollars and lastly i want to share this trade with you for apple aapl they're buying puts now perhaps they're done with the pump and now they're buying puts with two days till expiration they bought the 167 and a half puts they paid about three bucks and 80 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending about 43 million dollars remember as apple goes so will the market regardless of the manipulation moving on to the heat map analysis what's going on here a bloodbath with few exceptions of course the obvious healthcare we have names like pfizer j and j bristol myers all bucking the trend abbott laboratories another name you want to watch for we also have ford and gm trading higher both had good news today likewise chips specifically the infrastructure of chips we're talking about amat lamb research the value chips the likes of taiwan micron and i issued this tweet yesterday announcing that i'm buying puts on a basket of names in the chip sector including the high runners nvidia qualcomm amd and xilinx some of you of course bought puts on the etfs the likes of the soxl or smh i don't agree with that and the reason is i'm betting against specific names here the high runners and the reason is i know from my practice that we are trimming the high runners the nvidia's the amd's from portfolios and a lot of other managers are doing the same therefore the pain will come from these names not the value names not the names that have been in consolidation for a little while so when you bet using an etf buying puts on the smh for example you're not going to score as big as bidding on individual names i also want to talk about home builders the likes of lennar dr horton they're all lighting up green at least lennar not dr horton but that could follow too and the reason is the 10-year yield is slumping it's diving down big and for now that should drive mortgage rates down and that indeed will heat up the housing market at least for now a little bit and therefore you're seeing lumber prices moving higher because these home builders are buying so this is one pocket right now that i still like in the market if interest rates for whatever reason start to move higher again then we get a problem with these names also notice how the consumer staples the giants defensives lacks of procter and gamble kimberly clark notice how they're holding these are defensives companies with pricing power against this inflation and they're not going to be sold off easily you can take profits from the high runners in technology communication services and cyclicals but investors in these names tend to be for the long term for dividends and therefore they're not going to be shaken out easily moving on to the charts analysis my favorite starting with the spy and let's take a look and ooh, what a beating we have another gap and crap 
violating all supports right now awful day but you notice how oversold we got what does that mean we can get a bounce overnight in the futures that could happen the market could open gapping higher again but if Powell doesn't change his stance you can rebound on oversold technicals all you want but you're not going to be able to fight the fed by the way i said that in a tweet yesterday dip buyers will get slaughtered again and again and again and again until Powell reverses his stance or until the market becomes really oversold now pay attention to the numbers that i give you for example the market gapped higher in the morning but it struggled to break above the resistance of 461 and a half it took a little while before the market gathered the energy to move higher and then after flushing down the reversal of course notice how important 453 was 453 and 11 in my charts here's a three minutes chart and as you can see after the dump it held on to that support at least for a little while but the force of selling was so strong that even that support was violated so we have to go back to the 30 and zoom out a little bit to see where the next support is and in my chart it reads 447 my expectations are we should rebound a little higher at least in the futures or in the morning and maybe give it another shot at 453.11 then if that doesn't work you flush down again to 447 perhaps beyond that and here's a daily chart for the continuous contract in the s p 500 we have now broken the support of 4549 and a half where is the next support you might ask we have to identify it right here and it will be a soft support by the way it is 4000 472 if that doesn't work then we have 4384 and a half but look at where the momentum indicators are negative divergences accelerating to the downside by the way and the volume is spiking higher on the downside indicating that the pain is not over yet you can reach oversold conditions and bounce but the pain is not over yet what about the cues not looking any better here we gapped higher failed right away the gap and crap even though we had a bear flag by the way but the action in the overnight market was so strong the buying was so strong it pushed the nasdaq above 397 it gapped above that level catching support multiple times by the way just to illustrate the importance of 397 we will look at the three minutes chart it tried over and over and over again to confirm that support and then when it was broken it also tried to climb it back and it got rejected so the importance of 397 is illustrated right here when you break such a number where the algos and traders are betting on to hold this support the result is a flush down we went all the way down to the support zone and below the support zone so where is the next support you might ask let's not even talk about it because it's way below to illustrate that let's go to the daily chart for the continuous contract on the nasdaq the next legit support will be at 15,000. we have broken the latest support 15,976. and as you can see we might have the head and shoulder formation for now the momentum indicators are negative divergence and they're accelerating to the downside the volume is spiking higher on selling you have all the signs here that the pain is not over and we have a legitimate sell-off here in the market are we going to go down in one shot to 15,000? of course not it will be surprising even to me we have a lot of soft support between 15,000 and 15,976. i wouldn't be buyer here a buyer of the dip in the nasdaq unless we go down aggressively and fast to 15,000, and you see the RSI oversold dramatically. Then I will not hesitate to buy call options at least for a rebound trade. And what about the IWM? A lot of pain here in the Russell 2000 30 minutes chart. It gapped higher, facing the resistance of 223, failing to catch it as support. What happens next? It flushes down all the way to the next support, 218. And by the way, when we zoom in to a three minutes chart, it tried over and over and over again, at least twice. Major attempts, two major attempts to climb above 218 once again. It got rejected once, it got rejected again. That was the confirmation the double top for you to place a short at least till the end of the day the iwm flushed down closing at the lows of the day where is the next support you might add we go back to the 30 minutes chart it reads at 212 and by the way here's a weekly chart for the rut the big russell 2000 what an epic bull trap that was the breakout higher from the consolidation range that was an epic historic bull trap and for now it appears that the russell 2000 might break to the downside too early to say but we're keeping an eye on this chart moving on to the dixie the dollar index what's going on here still holding the dixie you have to beat it over and over and over again before it gives up the indicators are topping here we should see a flush down in the dollar yet the dollar continues to hold support and the reason is we have a sell-off in the market what do you think happens when you sell your stocks you're raising cash 
and that is supportive to the value of the US dollar. Yet the technicals indicate that the dollar should be trading down. We just need another currency to firm up a little bit. Moving on to gold, what's going on here? No major moves here in gold. Still waiting and waiting and waiting for more clarity from who? From the dollar and the 10 year yield. We might have some clarity in the 10 year because it is flushing down, no doubt about it, but the main enemy for gold is the dollar. And the dollar has not made its mind yet whether it's going to go up or down. Gold is going to wait. It is the mature guy in the room. Moving on to the 10-year yield. What's going on here? Losing the potential of a double bottom. Not going to happen now. We pierced below the last low. And now we're eyeing 1.375 for support. That should hold, at least in the short run. And if it happens, you'll see a rebound in the IWM and the cyclical names, the reopening names, the cruises, the airlines, etc, etc. But for now, winning the argument is the TLT weekly chart, still moving higher. And it needs to continue to do that to move far away from 149 because doing so will solidify that the TLT will go higher and the yield on the 10-year will slump down and this will not be a good outcome for the economy by the way because if anything the bond market is saying the economy will head into a recession what about the vix you thought it was dead and it comes back we had a little false signal in the four hours the macd indicator the vix is still highly elevated and therefore you're seeing bets buying puts on the uvxy etc etc rationally yes when the vix pops higher in a bull market aggressively so it is a sure bet that it's going to cool down and the market will recover but perhaps we have something different here. We have, perhaps, a legit panic in the market. A legit change of sentiment. Why do we say that, by the way? Because here's the weekly chart for the VIX, and it is breaking above the descending slope of resistance. Which means the momentum in the VIX is accelerating higher, and rapidly. Yes, we have some resistance here, at around 37.5. But if this is a legitimate change in sentiment, because Powell has changed from a dove to a hawk, we could see a massive pop that could rival the pop from last year so watch out here this is not looking good for the stock market the fact that we have a breakout in the vix this is an indicator that it's not just a panic it's not momentary perhaps no santa rally this year perhaps the grinch is coming to town moving on to apple a daily chart what's going on here it managed to break above the channel the upper band of the channel is it a false breakout or not well we have two days till the end of the week closing the week above the upper band of the channel is a confirmation that apple is breaking out closing back into the channel from a weekly perspective is an indicator that what we saw in apple is just a mere pop due to the options market activities and apple is just going to join the party to the downside along with the rest of the market moving on to tesla daily chart what's going on here is this the third rejection of 1174 and a half we certainly got close to that number and then flushed down right away the bears have multiple tests here before going aggressively short number one yes you now have a confirmation that 1174 and a half is a tough resistance and tesla will not be able to break above that number easily that's test number one check mark number one for the bears check mark number two is making a lower low which has yet to happen check mark number three if we go to a line chart this triangle is going to break out one way or the other and we're getting really close it could happen by tomorrow it has to happen if it breaks to the downside then you have check mark number two because when you look at it all in all what if this formation is a bear flag formation and sooner or later, Tesla will go down to revisit the trend line once again. Your check mark number three will be breaking below 1,000. So you have three targets to look at here for the bears. The bulls, you're not going to buy calls here until you have Tesla breaking above 1,174.5, closing the day above that number. Then you got a confirmation here that Tesla will move higher. What about Tulips, BTC? What's going on here? The market is crashing down, but BTC is holding. What does that say? It is a test of strength. That the resiliency in the tulip market is really strong. Could tulips break down eventually? Yes. Are we going to look at 53,200? If that number is broken, then it's over. Run for the hills. But for now, my bet, at least for now, tulips should move higher. Specifically, BTC Bitcoin. Lastly, what about AMC? What's going on here? A massive flush down, breaking below 32. And we're pretty much done here, apes it's over the only good news that you have right now is look at the rsi way oversold and therefore we're gonna get an oversold bounce is it gonna get us higher above 32 well you have two days now till the end of the week this is my message to the apes you gotta climb above 32 by the end of the week and if you fail to do so it's over this thing is gonna crash 
and the next support is 26 that's not gonna hold either so watch out here this battle is getting really interesting lastly we're moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow we have per usual the weekly jobless claims we combine that with the adp and now we have expectations and something to look at with the upcoming jobs report this Friday, which will be important to set the stage whether Powell is right or wrong in his aggressive approach to tightening the monetary policy. We also have some Fed zombies speaking, specifically Boystick. He's going to speak on housing prices. Mr. Boystick, how about you say housing prices are too high, pricing the majority of families out of the market? That would be nice. I don't think it'll happen, but one could hope, right? Anyways, folks, we're done here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. This is all I got for you for now, but I will talk to you again tomorrow. If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.